Welcome to Lesson 11, Communication Procedures. In this lesson, we'll discuss the communication procedures and phraseology you'll use when talking with air traffic control and other aircraft. Now, there's a specific way to talk on the radio that reduces confusion and congestion. These procedures are especially important when there are a lot of aircraft talking to ATC. You'll listen to excerpts of pilot and controller dialogue to help gain an understanding of the correct way to communicate when in an airplane. Knowing how and what to say before your flight will reduce any anxiety you may have about using the radios in your aircraft. Welcome back to the studio and we'd also like to welcome back Mr. Bob Gardner, a much admired member of the aviation community. Bob has uh, been a pilot uh, for a long time. He started actually in Alaska with the Coast Guard, uh, kind of a hobby back then, but since then he's been a pilot, a corporate pilot. Uh, he has also uh, been a charter pilot and he was the Chief of Communications for the 13th uh, Coast Guard District in Seattle, as well as a ham operator since 1947. Welcome, Bob. Bob, what is the most important factor in your mind for pilots uh, to demonstrate good aviation communication skills? I think being alert to the class of airspace they're flying in is the most important, who you should talk to or listen to in that class of airspace. We spend a lot of time in learning about class B and C and D airspace, but we spend most of our t time flying in class E airspace. And those other kinds of airspace stick up into class E airspace. As we near them, we need to know who we're going to be talking to, to, if we need to talk to anyone at all. And learning the lingo of aviation doesn't do you much good if you don't know where to use it. We're going to cover traffic advisories, light gun signals, radio phraseology, automated terminal information service, or ATIS, controller communications, flight service stations, emergency locator transmitters, direction finding, and transponder usage. Let's go to the classroom now with our instructor and get started. I'm Robert Bremer, and this is your last lesson. Now, the main function of ATC is to provide traffic separation for the aircraft in radar contact. This includes providing traffic advisories. Aircraft must have their transponder operating, and traffic is reported based on your ground track. ATC can only provide traffic advisories for the aircraft that they know about. This typically means the aircraft with transponders. They cannot report traffic that doesn't show up on their radar screen, such as some light sport aircraft and parachute activity. You must remain vigilant in looking for traffic as it's in the pilot in command's responsibility to see and avoid traffic. A controller will advise you of the traffic in relation to your position. Now, these advisories are based on your track over the ground and not on your actual heading. Let's take a closer look at how this works. Now, here is a 360 degree ground track and the wind is coming from the right. We're flying a heading of 0 to 0 degrees, yet the aircraft is tracking over the ground showing a 360 degree ground track. The traffic advisory ATC provides traffic is based on the ground track, not on the heading you're flying. Now this is important so you can look for the traffic in the correct quadrant. When ATC provides traffic information, they're giving it in terms of the face of a clock. As you sit in the cockpit, imagine a clock that's stretched around the outside of the cockpit. 12 o'clock is in front of you right here. 3 o'clock traffic is off your right wing. 6 o'clock traffic is behind you at your tail. And 9 o'clock traffic would be off your left wing. If ATC were to report Cessna 55 Foxtrot Papa, traffic 3 o'clock, one mile opposite direction. Now, if you spotted the traffic, you would reply with something like, Roger, we have the traffic, Cessna 55 Foxtrot Papa. If ATC advises you of traffic and you don't have the traffic in sight, respond, Roger, no contact, Cessna 55 Foxtrot Papa. Once you've made this call, it's important to continue to look for the traffic. Now, ATC will likely give additional traffic advisories, either until that traffic is no longer a factor or until you spot the traffic. Some newer airplanes have a traffic collision avoidance system. 
It's often called TCAS. TCAS provides traffic warnings in addition to the ATC advisories. The TCAS display will show your aircraft in relation to other transponders that it detects around you. Here we see a TCAS display and each of these little lights represents either red for the potential threats or the green transponders that aren't threats at this time. Bob, what are your suggestions for how a pilot can become more familiar with the airspace they operate in? Well, today's pilots have an embarrassment of riches. If they have the right box in their panel, they can run the cursor up to the airport. All the frequencies for that airport are displayed for them. But if you don't have that magic box, the A number one recommendation is the airport facilities directory. That little green book will give you everything you need to know. Once you've drawn out your proposed route, look at every airport along the route. Look under the airspace and communications listings. Uh, the airspace listings will tell you what class of airspace it is, uh, class B, class C, and what the frequencies are. If it's a part-time controlled airport, it'll tell you that and what the operating hours are. If it's uh, a part-time airport, it'll also tell you whether it reverts to class E or class G when the, when the controllers go home. Now that information is still also available on the uh, sectional, but the sectional refers you to the airport facilities directory, so you might as well get that in the first place. Let's take this time for an FAA test question. An ATC radar facility issues the following advisory to a pilot flying on a heading of 090. Traffic 3 o'clock, 2 miles, westbound. Where should the pilot look for this traffic? Only one answer, A, B, or C. The answer is B, south. Traffic information is given in azimuth from the aircraft in terms of the 12-hour clock. If an aircraft is proceeding on a heading east, 90 degrees, traffic located at the 3 o'clock position would be 90 degrees right of the nose, south of the aircraft. Got it? Good. Let's move on. New topic. This light gun signals back in the classroom. It's easy to communicate with ATC if you have functioning radios. But what would you do if your radio equipment became inoperable during flight? How would you communicate with ATC at a controlled airport? We'll move on to talk about light gun signals and how they can help you in case of a communications failure. Now, light gun signals are used by ATC at tower controlled airport to communicate with pilots who have had radio equipment failure or those aircraft that don't have radios at all. The light gun signals are color coded and provide you with different directions depending on ground or airborne operation. If you're on the ground and you experience a radio failure before departure, you'd call the tower by phone rather than expecting a light signal. They can easily give you a light signal, but sometimes it does distract from other more important activities. They would prefer you shut down and call them by phone to arrange prior departure with the light gun signal. Now, if you're on the ground and you see a flashing green light signal, it indicates you're cleared to taxi. A steady green light, a steady green light signal indicates you're cleared for takeoff. A flashing red light gun signal indicates you should taxi clear of the runway in use. And a steady red, just like a traffic signal, indicates you should stop wherever you are. If you see a flashing white light gun signal, you should return to your starting point on the airport. An alternating red and green light means you should exercise extreme caution when operating on the surface of that airport. Now, the light gun signals you see on the ground have different meanings than those you see in the air. Let's take a look at the use of airborne light gun signals. First, if you're in the air and you have a communications failure, you should remain outside of the airport traffic area and observe the traffic flow. You can do this by flying above the traffic pattern or remaining safely outside of it until you've observed the flow. You should then enter the traffic pattern and look for light gun signals from the tower. Because it's a tower controlled field, they're going to expect radio contact to have been made with every aircraft. And when they see you entering the traffic pattern without first talking to you, that's their signal to get the light gun out. The light gun signals in the air are similar to what you would see on the ground, but they have slightly different meanings. The flashing white does not apply in the air. 
So if you're in the air, ATC will not give you a flashing white signal. A flashing green light in the air means you should return for a landing. A steady green light indicates you're cleared to land. The flashing red light indicates the airport is unsafe. Do not land. You need to land at another airport. A steady red light indicates to give way to another aircraft. It doesn't mean you may not be able to get into that airport, but just means you should give way to another aircraft at that time. If you see the alternating red and green light, it's similar to the meaning on the ground. You should exercise extreme caution when trying to land at that airport. If you're airborne and receiving light gun signals from ATC, you should acknowledge the tower that you understand the light signals by rocking the wings during the day or blinking your landing light at night. This lets ATC know you've seen and understand the light gun signal and will operate accordingly. All right, let's take a question on light gun signals. Which light signal from the control tower clears a pilot to taxi? Again, pretty straightforward. It's only one. The correct answer, A, flashing green light signal clears a pilot to taxi. Okay, let's get back to the classroom and a new topic. This one, radio phraseology. We're going to move on and discuss radio phraseology. Pilots speak with a specific language that's been developed over the years. It makes it easy to communicate with air traffic control and ensures a universal understanding. This phraseology reduces frequency congestion and minimizes confusion. Listen to this example. And Salem Tower Bonanza 169 Golf Romeo. We are on a uh, extended uh, right downwind here for 3 4. November 9 or Alpha Mike, make left close traffic, runway 34, clear for takeoff. Niner Alpha Mike, clear for takeoff, left traffic, 434. Bonanza Niner Golf Romeo, traffic is an Alaris taking the runway for departure, runway 34, clear to land. The International Phonetic Alphabet is used when referring to letters when spoken over the air. The phonetic alphabet assigns words to each letter, such as Alpha for A, Bravo for B, Charlie for C, and so on. So there's no confusion when speaking over the radio as to what letter is being used. For example, when identifying your aircraft by type and tail number, the letters GR would not be spoken as GR because they could easily be confused with other letters of the alphabet. Using the phonetic alphabet, you would say Golf Romeo. The tail numbers 169 are not set as 169. Numbers are spoken individually. In this case, it would be as 169er. The number 9 has its own pronunciation due to the fact that 9 can sound like 5 when spoken quickly over the radio. Say 9er instead of 9. November 6, 9er, Golf Romeo, Salem Tower, say your position. Roger, we are approximately. Uh... Uh, seven miles to the north, and we have information. Bravo, like the land. November 9 Golf Romeo, Roger, make right traffic, runway 34. Roger, right traffic for runway 34. For this phrase, Bonanza 169er Golf Romeo is the correct phraseology you would use over the radio. Let's take a look at how this reports in altitude. Altitudes are stated with the separate digits of thousands plus hundreds. For example, this is an altitude reading of 4,500 feet. Over the radio, we don't say 4,500 feet. The digits are spoken individually. This altitude is stated as 4,500 feet. This gives ATC a better understanding of where you're at. Saying 4,500 could be confused with 45,000 or some other combination of numbers. And 169 Golf Romeo, we're at our contact 5 miles east of McMinnville, Portland, altimeter 3019. 3019, thank you. 9 Golf Romeo. Welcome, verify your altitude again, please. Uh, we're just coming up on 4,000, 9 Golf Romeo. Thank you. Altitudes above 10,000 feet are set in a slightly different way. This example of 10,500 feet would be reported as 10,500 feet. An altitude of 13,500 feet would be reported as 13,500 feet. Uh, 
Fire Shuttle, 1303, 2800 for 9000. Uh, 1303, Portland to French, radar can't take, fly maintain 15000. 15000, Southwest 1303. While en route, you can obtain weather information from a couple of different sources. Now, we'll briefly discuss how you would contact them over the radio. A flight service station, or FSS, is one source for en route weather advisories. Although they are called flight service stations, in your initial call to them, you do not refer to them as flight service stations, or FSS. Instead, your initial contact call would be Seattle Radio, Bonanza 169, or Golf Romeo. Another source for weather advisories is EFAS, or en route flight advisory service. This is also commonly known as Flight Watch and is very useful in flight because it provides weather advisories pertinent to the route and altitude being flown. Rather than contacting them as Seattle EFES, they are referred to as Seattle Flight Watch. Your initial contact call would be Seattle Flight Watch Bonanza 169 or Golf Romeo, followed by the rest of your communication to them. Uh. Seattle Flight Watch, Bonanza 169 Golf Romeo, Salem. And we do have an air med for some occasional IFR conditions south of your present position. And the Salem altimeter standby. The term initial radio contact or initial call up means the first radio call you make to a given facility or the first call to a different controller or FSS specialist within a facility. Use the following format, name of the facility being called, your full aircraft identification as filed in the flight plan, type of message to follow or your request if it is short, and the word over if required. When the aircraft manufacturer's name or model is stated, the prefix N is dropped. The first two characters of the call sign may be dropped only after ATC calls you by your last three digits. Now, let's talk a little bit about aviation uh, language. Is it, uh, how important is it, rather, for pilots to use the correct phraseology? Is it better to say nothing or say it well? Well, you never say nothing. I'll answer your question with a, que with a question, however. Uh, what is correct phraseology? Air traffic control handbooks have to use specific phraseology in the air traffic control handbook, and they're tested on it. Pilots don't have a similar requirement. There's no regulation that requires pilots to say certain things in a certain way. With experience, it comes. But just referring to things like Chapter 4, Section 2 of the AIM for uh, suggested uh, phraseology to uh, look at the pilot controller glossary for definitions of terms, uh, these are all useful uh, things that pilots can do. Uh, but the AIM only scratches the surface of what you need to know. Uh, those of us who prepare uh, communications uh, textbooks uh, uh, have flown into a lot of different situations and, and uh, we're basing our recommendations on experience. Uh, now there's one thing everybody should understand. Controllers appreciate brevity, but not at the expense of understanding. Let's take a question on radio phraseology. When flying a Cessna with this call sign, the correct phraseology for initial contact with Portland AFSS is, give you some time to look over each of these possible answers, only one is correct. Think you have it? Okay, let's see. When flying Cessna, November 111 Foxtrot Papa, the correct phraseology is A. Portland Radio, Cessna 111, Foxtrot Papa, receiving Ardmore Vortac, over. By way of further explanation, the name of the facility being called, your full aircraft ID is filed in the flight plan, type of message to follow, and the word over if required. When the aircraft manufacturer's name or model is stated, the prefix N is dropped. The first two characters of the call sign may be dropped only after ATC calls you by your last three letters or numbers. Okay, a little complicated there, but I think you figured that one out. All right, let's move to a new topic. This one, the Automated Terminal Information Service, or ATIS. Now, Bob, what should a pilot do if they make a mistake, whether it's uh, using the wrong frequency or saying the wrong thing? 
Well, how many times have I heard an airline pilot say, uh, Seattle Center, uh, Big Bird 2-3 uh, X-ray is climbing out of 15,000 for flight level 330, and the voice comes back, you're still on tower frequency. Or a corporate jet saying, a tower, uh, Buzz Bomb uh, 234 is ready for takeoff, so you're still on ground control frequency. So everybody does it. Uh, if you say, say something that you in, uh, interpret to be wrong, say correction, and then say the right thing, and, and that correction is in the glossary, by the way. Automated Terminal Information Service, or ATIS, is available at tower-controlled airports. ATIS provides pilots with information that is important to know before taking off or entering the traffic pattern for that airport. Listen. Salem Airport, information Bravo, 19056 Zulu. Wind variable at four, visibility one zero. Sky clear below one two thousand. Temperature seven, dew point three, altimeter three zero two one. Visual approach is in use, landing and departing runways three one and three four. Birds on and in the vicinity of the airport, including large flocks of geese. Hazardous weather information for the Salem area available on flight watch or flight service frequencies. On initial contact, advise you have received information Bravo. Okay, what we heard here was those clear skies. The altimeter was uh, 30.21. Uh, and uh, there's some geese in the vicinity in Salem. And uh, other than that, nice day to fly. If ATC had to give this information out every time a new aircraft called, the frequency would be so congested they would not be able to talk to other aircraft. So this recorded message is provided on its own frequency, updated hourly and available to pilots to listen to prior to takeoff or landing. ATIS provides the following information, ceilings, visibility and obstructions to visibility, the temperature and the dew point, which is important because if they are close, you can expect fog to be forming at the airport. ATIS also provides the wind direction, which helps you align for landing, the barometer setting, which you want to have properly set before landing, and it will also advise of the runway in use. The ceilings and visibility may not be reported if the ceilings are above 5,000 feet and the visibility is greater than five statute miles. Listen to this pilot after receiving ATIS. Next up, controller communications. Now, first we'll cover communication with controllers at an airport while your aircraft is still on the ground. Prior to taxiing, your initial contact will be with the ground controller. A ground controller is one who works the entire surface of the airport and controls aircraft that are on the ground. We'll discuss some specific clearances you might receive. If you get a clearance to taxi to runway 30, that's a clearance to taxi on the taxiway and across all intersecting runways. But it's not a clearance to taxi onto the active runway. Listen to this interchange. And uh, Salem gone, the Bonanza 169 Golf Romeo, with information Charlie ready to taxi. Bonanza 169 Golf Romeo, Salem ground taxi to runway 34. Roger, 3-4. Bonanza 9 Gulf Romeo, see your direction of flight? Uh, we'll be heading to the north. Bonanza 9 Gulf Romeo, roger. A clearance to taxi into position and hold is a clearance to taxi onto the active runway and prepare for takeoff. But it is not a clearance to actually take off in that aircraft. To take off, you need an explicit takeoff clearance. Listen to this. Salem Tower, Bonanza 169 Gulf Romeo. Ready for departure, straight out, runway 34. Cessna 574, turn left at Alpha and contact ground point niner. Roger, 574, turn left, Alpha, point niner. November 169er, Golf Romeo, Salem Tower, straight out departure approved, runway 34, cleared for takeoff. Roger, cleared for takeoff, runway 34, 9 Golf Romeo. After landing at a tower controlled airport, the tower controller will typically tell you to contact ground control, but you need to stay with the tower until you're told to switch frequencies. Listen. Bonanza Niner Golf Romeo, turn left at Juliet, contact ground point Niner. 
Roger left to Juliet and then contact Grand Point Niner, Nine Golf Romeo. Salem gone, Bonanza 169 Golf Romeo. Clear of the active taxi to the restaurant. Bonanza 169 Golf Romeo, Salem ground, taxi to parking. Most ground control frequencies are 121 point something, point 0.9, point 0.3, etc. Therefore, the tower will usually tell you to contact ground 121.9. However, they may assume you're familiar with that airport and they'll just tell you to contact ground 0.9. The typical ground frequency is 121, so you would tune in 121.9. On landing, you should not change to the ground control frequency until instructed to do so by the tower. At airports without a control tower, you need to know which common traffic advisory frequency is used, and this frequency is called CTAF for radio calls. You can find the CTAF frequencies on sectional charts and in the airport facilities directory. If there's no flight service station at the airport, a Unicom frequency is used. This is commonly a frequency of 122.8 or 123.0. When there is no flight service station or Unicom at an uncontrolled airport, a multicom frequency is used for communications. The multicom frequency is 122.9. You would use the unicom or multicom frequencies to self announce your intentions at a non towered airport. Aurora traffic, Skipper 3801 Romeo is about a mile and a half northwest over the river on a 45 for left downwind 35. We see the departing traffic. And we're traffic here at Charlie Delta is turning uh, northwest to crosswind, looking for the 45 traffic. Aurora State. Aurora traffic, Bonanza 169 Golf Romeo, turning left base, runway 35, or. Okay, another question for you. After landing at a tower controlled airport, when should the pilot contact ground control? Give you a chance to look these over. Only one correct answer. Okay, got it? Good. After landing at a tower controlled airport, when should the pilot contact ground control when advised to do so by the tower? That correct answer is A. A pilot who has just landed should not change from tower to ground frequency until advised to do so by the tower. Okay, let's move on to a new topic. This one. Flight service stations. We've talked about flight service stations a few times already, so we'll go into a little more detail about the services they provide and the frequencies you use to make contact with them. Flight service stations are established at airports to provide information. At airports without a control tower, but with an FSS, an airport advisory area is established within 10 nautical miles of that airport. As we mentioned before, a flight service station may be abbreviated as FSS. On sectional charts, you can look for the blue box which would identify a flight service station. For example, let's say we're trying to call Elizabeth City Flight Service on 122.2 or on 122.05. Prior to entering the airport advisory area, you should contact the local flight service station for airport advisories. The flight service station cannot give you clearance information, such as clear to land or clear to take off, but they can let you know about traffic in the area or give you other airport information. ATC services that deal with flight service stations are available on a number of different frequencies. Some of the more common frequencies are 123.6, 122.3 and 121.5. Flight service stations typically monitor a whole host of frequencies, but these are some of the more common frequencies that they use. An airport advisory area is the area within 10 statute miles of an airport where a control tower is not operating, but where a flight service station is located. At such locations, the FSS provides advisory service to arriving and departing aircraft. It's not mandatory that pilots participate in the Airport Advisory Service Program, but it's strongly recommended. Another good operating practice is to collect 
uh, to check in with Flight Watch on 122.0 every once in a while to ask about any weather changes at your destination or along your route. Uh, be sure you give your location to the briefer uh, who answers and always make it a rule to fly toward improving weather and never toward deteriorating weather. A third recommendation is you listen to the ATIS at airports that you're flying over to see whether what's actually happening uh, holds up with the forecast. All right, let's work on another FAA test question. Prior to entering an airport advisory area, a pilot should, which of these? Study them closely. Think you know it? Okay, let's see. Prior to entering an airport advisory area, a pilot should C, contact the local FSS for airport and traffic advisories. An airport advisory area is the area within 10 statute miles of an airport where a control tower is not operating, but where a flight service station is located. At such locations, the FSS provides advisory service to arriving and departing aircraft. Got it? Good. Now next up, your instructor is going to cover the ELT, DF steer, and the transponder. So let's get back to the classroom for those discussions. We'll discuss emergency locator transmitters and services available to lost aircraft. The emergency locator transmitter, or ELT as it's abbreviated, is a battery operated transmitter that emits a tone on the international frequencies of 121.5 and 243.0 megahertz. Here's what that tone sounds like. Listen. The ELT is typically located in the aircraft in such a position that it will hopefully survive a crash. The ELT is designed to be activated by the G-forces present during an airplane crash. Those G-forces activate a switch inside the ELT which turns it on and starts broadcasting the signal. This signal will be received by ATC and will thus alert them that there's been an accident. The ELT will help search and rescue efforts to locate a downed aircraft. A hard landing can also activate an ELT. If you experience a hard landing, then monitor 121.5 megahertz before engine shutdown to make sure you haven't accidentally turned on your ELT. You should contact ATC if you find that you have inadvertently activated your ELT so they will not assume an aircraft has crashed. You should periodically test your ELT because you need to make sure that in the event of an actual emergency, it's going to function. You may test your ELT only during the first five minutes of every hour. Okay, good. Be careful when you perform these tests that you have accurate timing. If you test at times other than within the first five minutes of the hour, you're going to cause some undue alarm at the FSS. Now next up is the DF steer. If during a flight you find that you have become lost, there's help. ATC and FSS can use VHF direction finding gear to assist you to determine your direction from the station. And this is known as a DF steer. These facilities have ground equipment that display the direction each time the airplane transmits a signal. Your aircraft must have a VHF transceiver or communications radio to take advantage of this service. If it does have that receiver and you think you're lost, you can tell ATC you'd like to request a DF steer. By transmitting several times over the radio, the controller can advise you of the relative bearing to the airport or provide you with a series of headings to the airport. Next up, the transponder. Now, the transponder tracking is a service provided by ATC. ATC radar relies on a signal transmitted from the radar antenna site and from a reply signal transmitted from your aircraft transponder. Now, Bob, what services do you recommend that uh, VFR pilots uh, take advantage of while flying en route? No doubt about that. Radar flight following. Mm. Uh, everybody, in my mind, should, should use radar flight following. It's, it's nothing so reassuring as talking to someone who knows where you are at all times in case you might need a little help. Uh, following up on an earlier answer, you find this in the airport facilities directory. A little R in a circle means that they have radar, and you'll find the frequencies of air traffic control centers and terminal radar facilities. 
know, and these people lead you by the hand every place you want to go, and, and it's, it's really uh, comforting. Uh, if you're departing a tower-controlled airport, learn the appropriate frequency for the overlying radar facility and ask the tower for a handoff. Uh, departing an uncontrolled airport, you might find that the overlying airspace is controlled by a center and you'll have to get some altitude before they can pick you up. But uh, just call them up and say, request flight following, tell them your destination. Request flight following and the, from that point on, uh, they lead you through Class C airspace, they lead you through Class D airspace, you don't have to do anything. These radar services are used continuously for the control of aircraft flying under Instrument Flight Rules, or IFR. Most ATC facilities will also provide traffic advisories and limited vectoring to VFR aircraft. To receive these services, you must have a transponder. Transponder operations at an ATC facility can provide you with a couple of different levels of service. The basic radar service provides airport traffic advisories and some limited vectoring to VFR aircraft. Stage 2 air services adjust the flow of arriving VFR and IFR aircraft into the traffic pattern. This will make it very nice for getting into a crowded airport. Stage 3 radar services provide sequencing and separation for participating VFR aircraft. But remember that as a pilot in command, it's always your responsibility to look out of the cockpit to see and avoid other traffic. The transponder in your aircraft looks something like this one here. The transponder is set to 1200, which is the VFR squawk code you use when flying VFR. If you're flying with flight following, ATC will give you a specific code to squawk. Otherwise, you should always use 1200. Fall on approach, Bonanza 169 Golf Romeo. Bonanza 169, go for me over Roger. Our current position is uh, about uh, 12 uh, miles north of uh, Salem. Uh, we'd like to overfly your Class C airspace uh, northbound uh, towards Capuz. Large shuttle was 1303, 2800 for 9000. 1303, Portland to French Radar, contact, climb, maintain 15000. 15000, Southwest 1303. There are some codes you should avoid putting into the transponder unless you have a particular situation. The code 7500 tells ATC that you are being hijacked. You don't want to broadcast that frequency unless indeed you are being hijacked. The next code is 7600. 7600 tells ATC that you've lost communication radios. Perhaps your GPS or your transponder is still working, so you'd want to tell ATC that you've lost your ability to communicate with them. The next code to avoid unless you have an emergency in flight is 7700. This alerts ATC that your aircraft has an emergency of some sort. If you get into an emergency situation and you have time, by all means, put 7700 into your transponder. The last transponder code you should avoid is 7777. This is a code used by the military to indicate you're being intercepted. You shouldn't use that frequency unless you are, in fact, being intercepted by the military. Transponder operation is important even if you're not talking to ATC. You should operate your aircraft squawking the VFR code 1200 because it does a couple of important things. First, ATC has radar that allows them to see other aircraft regardless of whether we're talking to them or not. If they see a transponder code, that indicates they've got a target out there providing additional information for ATC. Now we all know it's possible for a VFR pilot to stay away from tower controlled operations pretty much for their entire career. Now, do you think this is a good idea or do you think all pilots should experience Class B, Class C airspace? Well, I think it's a mistake. Uh, first, in the first place, you, in order to qualify for your private pilot certificate, you have to make three full stop landings at a tower controlled airport. But no one should consider themselves to be a competent pilot unless they can fly into Class C or Class D airspace. Class B airspace might be too far away to fly to uh, during a training flight but uh, definitely Class D and Class C should be part of uh, the 
uh, every uh, pilot's repertoire. Uh, I should mention that many pilots are hesitant to call ATC because they don't want to bother the controllers. Controllers' paycheck depends on traffic count. They want you to call them. Just the controllers don't need help, though. They're trained professionals, and they are happiest when pilots just follow the rules. Thanks so much for being with us again, Bob Gardner. Now back to our instructor. Also, if you've got a transponder in your aircraft and you're flying in the vicinity with lots of jet or military aircraft, those aircraft are typically equipped with TCAS equipment. TCAS allows those airplanes to see us and avoid a collision. Transponder operation is important and therefore the transponder needs to be working correctly. Your transponder should be inspected every 24 calendar months to make sure it has proper operation. Okay, are you ready for a final FAA test question? Okay, this one on transponders. When making routine transponder code changes, pilots should avoid inadvertent selection of which codes? Which of these, A, B, or C? Which one do you think it is? Let's see if you have the correct answer. It is C. When making routine code changes, you should avoid selecting codes 7500, 7600, or 7700, thereby preventing false alarms at automated ground facilities. Okay, that's the end of Lesson 11 on Communication Procedures. You should have a better understanding now of the correct phraseology to use when talking to ATC. Now, the more you talk with ATC over the radio, the more you'll be comfortable with your phraseology. Likewise, the more you listen to aviation communications, the more you'll understand the communication procedures we use. Now, remember, ATC is there to help you, so take advantage of the services they provide to assist you in having a safe flight. Practice communications with your flight instructor before going into unfamiliar airports. You'll feel more at ease when you actually make the call. We'll see you next time.